Hi, I'm Tony Bowen and welcome back for part four of my Cato E8 build series that I've done. You got a bonus this month in between. I had a part three and a half where I talked about how I did the modifications to the fuel tank and some other detail parts and modifications I made. That was originally part of this part, but all of a sudden that video got to be about 50 minutes long and I thought nobody wants a video that long. I apologize already because this video is going to run a little long with my DCC decoder installation that I put into this locomotive. However, I have felt that many times when I have watched install videos on decoders, they haven't always been explicit enough. And so I really took the time to go step by step by step explicitly explaining all the things I'm doing. Now the decoder in this is nothing fancy. It's just a regular TCS drop-in decoder, no sound, no keep alive or anything like that. So this might be a really good one for beginners. If you're somebody that's been in the hobby a long time, you've done several decoder installations, this might tend to be a little boring for you. So I hope you'll sit back and enjoy this month's video. And so now it's time to move on to decoder installation. And so I will be adding to this locomotive, just a TCS uh, KOD8A decoder. And so right now, if I take the shell off it, essentially it has just the DC Cato board. And so you're gonna see how I essentially change from the DC board to putting in the TCS decoder board and some other modifications that probably are not new to anybody um, but things that I add to make it a little more reliable when it comes to running. So I'm going to pull the fuel tank off also. No sense having my hard work of any of the details on that getting bent up and so I have it basically stripped down to its basic shell or excuse me its basic chassis. So one thing I always like to do before I do any decoder installation is before I take the original um, board out, I like to see that the locomotive runs. Um, I find this is just a great way to debugging any kind of problems that if it doesn't run well now, or if it doesn't run at all, and I put the decoder in, I can already say, okay, it wasn't running before. It's not a decoder issue. So. A trick that I always used to do when I worked at a hobby shop while I was going to college was just, you know, putting a locomotive, either turning it upside down or sometimes if it's a long enough locomotive like this, setting it on a little paint bottle and essentially taking just a good old Tech 2 um, power pack and just seeing, will it run? Does it run? And in this case, this one seems to have plenty of get up and go. So it kind of checks out that, okay, it runs well now, so knowing that mechanically it runs, by the time I put the decoder in it, hopefully we have the same results. So if you've done N-scale decoder installations before, um, I can't say that you may learn anything necessarily new from here, but I'm gonna show you how I essentially take my regular DC locomotive that I'm starting off with and taking out the old board and essentially what I do when it comes to putting in the new DCC board. So here's the locomotive I'm working on, um, 649, and here's a six sister unit that I've already done, um, 654. And just some things as I'm walking through of what the original had and what we'll work towards for our final project at the end. So just a few tools that I always find to be very handy. Um, a pair of tweezers, a small bladed screwdriver, sometimes maybe a little bit wider bladed screwdriver, an X-Acto knife, and then so many decoders um, really benefit from having the keep and tape. And I bought this, you know, five years ago and it's essentially a roll in N scale will last a person essentially a lifetime. So these are just some of the basic tools um, that I have. Other things that I will use is I've got some solder cleaner, solder, 
got kind of a little handy dandy um, pad to put on my finger for when I'm using my soldering gun that is heat sensitive and won't burn my finger. And then obviously my soldering iron and just a little wet sponge for kind of cleaning off the tips and stuff like that. So those are the basic tools that I'll use um, for this project. So the first steps, when I approach this, there's a little plastic tab that Kato gives you. I usually put my thumb on it, or my finger on it, take a little small screwdriver and pry that up. You will want to keep this. Um, in some locomotive builds, you might need to put that back in. Other times, depending if you solder your uh, pickups to it, you may not use it. I find a lot of times I'm able to um, kind of push it right back in after I install the DCC board. So don't lose that little piece. Also, the little tabs here are easy to break. So you'll want to make real sure that when you kind of lift it, you're not too forceful. You don't want to break any of those tabs. Otherwise, that piece will then be useless to you. One other thing that is... Um, pretty easy to break if you're not careful is your tabs coming up from the motor. So I just lightly kind of just push those upward. Um, sometimes if they stand straight up at a 90 degree angle, great. Other times if they don't, that's all right. And then essentially there's a little tab back here. If you kind of slide the board forward and essentially boom, that's out already. So that's, that's the easy part, the removal. The next part is the pickups. And these brass pieces that go parallel on each side, you wanna be very careful with. You can bend them, you can cause them to kink real easy. So you wanna treat them real, real gentle. Um, you're gonna to have to wrap some cape and tape around that because you wanna insulate that this pickup that is coming up will not electrify them anymore. And so I usually take just a little Sharpie and just put a couple little marks just so I know where that tape is going to have to go. You also don't want to wrap the tape too much on them. Usually once around is enough. The reason that is, is that the thicker you make that tape on either end, the front or the back, it has just the little power pickups on it. And that's all the power it gets. So if you make that thicker and they stand up off those tabs, you tend to lose some power. And so some things I have done with my locomotives, like the sister unit here, is yeah, the DCC board is in and the brass pickups are laying down, but I'll come back and put a little bit of cape and tape on there so that they lay nice and flat and so that electrical conductivity is much better. It's a little more reliable. Um, I've had both some Cato E units, F units, that if you just lie on this pressure being put on those brass pickups to take care of it, sometimes they'll tend to cut out or they'll run a little bit and stop and run a little bit and stop, where most of the time the problem is occurring is that these aren't making proper contact. And so just taking a little piece of that cape and tape, going from one side to the other, just kind of laying those down. You don't have to press them down hard, but just making sure they lay down usually solves the problem. And as I said, the cape and tape is cheap. So if I put it here, kind of underneath the headlight um, pickups and back here just to hold it down, and then at the very end, that is definitely worth worth my time because I'm going to have a better uh, reliable running locomotive for me. So I've marked where I need to isolate the power from getting to it. Those other parts I will do after the DCC board is in. So I'm going to take my cape and tape now and just pull off a, a little strip here and come back with an exacto knife and just kind of trim it because as i said i need just enough to wrap around that board so it doesn't take a whole lot of this 
And the cape and tape I use has really good stick to it. So usually if I kind of lay it on a board and don't press down, it still has enough for me to, to use. So I'll pull up one of the pickups. I've already kind of made my marks with the Sharpie. So I lay that flat on my board. Kind of lay that in between where my marks are. And then essentially I'll just kind of fold over, give it just a little pinch, and now I have that extra. And so a lot of times with that extra, I'll just come back with my X-Acto knife and I just cut that right out of the way. This extra piece, that's garbage I don't need. This piece, I have just a little bit of a tail on it, and so I'll just kind of fold it down, and boom, that one is done. I will duplicate the same thing for the other side of the locomotive. So I'll lay that one there. this one up, lay it down flat, get my piece of cape and tape, there's where my two marks are, lay it down, flip the piece over, kind of wrap the cape and tape in it. Come back and cut off the excess piece of it. That's just garbage. Put that in my garbage can. And then the little tail end part, I just kind of wrap around. So, both of my pickups now are basically insulated for the decoder. So here you can see, coming up from the trucks, there is essentially a brass piece that comes up and the top of that brass piece falls right into these channels. And that's all that picks up the electric current along there. So if it doesn't make good contact with any of those, that's where your locomotive might go and stop and that doesn't make running real fun when your locomotive goes so far and then stops, goes so far and stops. And so that's where taking that extra time and once the decoder is installed, putting a little bit of uh, cape and tape to hold those um, uh, power pickups down really pays off. So essentially I'm going to get ready to put these back in. They have a little hole and a little plastic tab here so that kind of lines up where the center needs to go. And don't be surprised if you'll get them in and then they kind of pop out. I've had that happen to me many, many times. Um, just be patient with it. Take your time is the best you can do. And the more you work with them, um, the easier it gets. Okay, so that one's going to continue to pop out. Once I get the decoder in there, it'll tend to hold it down. So I'm going to do the same thing on the other side to get them to lay down flat so I can get the decoder in there. All right, so both of my brass pickups are back in. Um, even, and I don't know if the camera will pick this up, but even that they're in, you can see there's a little springiness in the front and the back. That's where, if it's not making that good contact, it's gonna sh short out, or I should say stop on you. And so, taking that extra time, wrapping them, that's where that really pays off. So our next step is obviously the decoder. Now I have found being um, a school teacher and wanting the most um, bang for my buck of shopping around for decoders. And so I would highly recommend you do the same. There are many good hobby shops out there um, that offer, you know, the, the, TCS, whether you like TCS, whether you like Digitrax, um, 
NCE, whatever it might be. But do shop around because you'll find many times if you buy them either um, in bulk or if you are um, able to get, you know, discounts on them, um, that, that really helps um, save you some money. And so I definitely have about four main sources that I look at first and essentially kind of see who has the decoder at the cheaper price. And that's what I go with. The other thing is to look at shipping, you know, decoders, they don't weigh a whole lot. And so if you're getting charged like $12 for something that doesn't even weigh, you know, three ounces, um, you may, you may want to look for something different or, you know, like myself, a lot of times I'll save up and, and combine orders saying, okay, I need some decoders, but I'm also buying some scenery supplies or that. And if I buy over $50 worth of stuff, I get free shipping. So, you know, just good tips that I'm sure I'm not telling anybody things you haven't even thought of before. So, so for my decoders, I'm using the, the TCS, the KOD 8A. And so when the decoder comes, I always save the packaging because the one thing with the TCS decoders is they have a no goof proof warranty on them that you can send them back if there's any kind of problems, um, if there's any kind of manufacturing errors, things like that. And I will say over the uh, seven years that I've had a DCC system, I have probably sent back maybe four decoders and the beauty of it's been I've paid, you know, whether it's, you know, a $36 decoder or a $41 decoder or what. And essentially if I send them back, I have the original package. I kind of tell them, you know, what I did or what the decoder was doing within a matter of a week's time, either I'm getting my same decoder back repaired or I'm just getting a new one to replace it. So essentially at this point, it's almost like when you buy one decoder, and you keep track of everything, and if there's any problems with it, and you send it back, essentially you may never have to buy another decoder if something goes wrong with it. So, so I, I've been real happy with that. So on these, it has two headlight um, pickups. Obviously, with this being an A unit, I will only need one of them. And so this back one will get um, snipped off. It's also good to kind of orient yourself of what is the front of the decoder and what is the back. This is the front. It has these two brass pads for basically where they'll lay on the tabs. It also has the hole back here where when the decoder goes back in and kind of gets pushed back, it kind of holds it in place. So like on this one, the brass tabs are here with the plastic on it. And then it has just a plastic tab that kind of holds that decoder down so it doesn't kind of ride up in the back. So I'll get ready to put this decoder in place. All right, as I get ready to install the decoder, I want to be ever so mindful that the two tabs that are sticking up, I don't want those to be under the decoder. They have to be on top because they're going to kind of fold over and then get soldered on. A lot of times they recommend, you know, they can just lay on there, you can put the plastic tab back on, and that will be enough to hold it down. Yeah, my experience is that's not necessarily true. So when I lay that on there, I tend to bend those over and then just give it a little spot of um, solder to really hold it on there well, and also helps with the conductivity of electric current. So kind of glide that in there on one side, there's the other. So the decoder's laying down, and then I push it back in place. So essentially at this point, the decoder's in. So then I'll take my smaller screwdriver, and I'll just kind of bend that tab. Don't be too forceful, because you don't want to bend too much and break them on each side. Just kind of push them down. Because the thing I will do in a little bit is I will come back on one side with the screwdriver to hold it down, and on the other side have my soldering iron just to touch that to hold it in place. All right, I always like to make sure my soldering iron tip is clean. So I have just some 
Radio Shack kind of tip cleaner that I picked up several years ago. Just to make sure anything from my last project, any residues or stuff, still aren't on there. If you have not installed a decoder before, or if your soldering skills aren't real great, you know, it might be good to get some practice in of just soldering some wires together, um, getting the, the feel and the flow of the solder. Because um, the last thing you want to do is have a, you know, a 30 or $40 decoder and all of a sudden glob on so much solder um, that it, you know, seeps over onto the board and, and shorts out or um, ruins some of the other components. Because at that point, if that happens, your decoder is basically done, you, you know. Um, so you really want to take your time um, with the soldering iron and, and the decoder and that. So, so I know there's a lot of different techniques that people use for soldering. Myself, I tend to like to kind of make sure the, the piece is a little warm and get a little solder at least on the tip first. So I've got a little solder on there. doesn't take much. And so soldering iron is plenty hot. So I'm going to come with the bigger screwdriver now and it's going to essentially hold that tab down and then I'm going to come back with my soldering iron and now that one tab is is down permanently in place. If I ever have to replace this the uh, DCC board obviously I'm going to have to unsolder those but just the same thing. You'll pull off the little plastic tab, heat that up till it loosens, bend back the little tabs ever so slightly, and essentially you can pull your board out. So I have the uh, fireman side of the locomotive done, so I'm just going to rotate the locomotive and repeat the same process, putting just a little solder on the tab first. Taking the screwdriver again, holding that tab down so I can kind of just melt that solder in place on that pad. Oops, and this happens from time to time, and it does here. Just not enough solder. Just a little more needs to be on there. You don't want to have too much, but you can always have too little and always add a little more. All right, it, the DCC board is now soldered and in place. Okay, at this time, this is a great time to add that little plastic piece that we took off at the very beginning. And so I usually just kind of flip the locomotive around here, looking through my uh, desk magnifying glass, kind of lining up the holes. And then a lot of times just using my thumbnail and just kind of pushing that in place. Sometimes it rides up a little bit because there's some solder and that underneath it, um, but I just keep it there. So at this point, um, I'm going to take it over and get it ready to uh, program. Okay, I brought the locomotive to my program track. I know there's a lot of people that sometimes will have their program track built right into their layout. Um, I have mine totally separate, so it comes from my command station onto its own little separate piece of track. So one thing is always remembering, and I use a NCE Pro Cab, is 
you want to make sure that you have it already set for programming. So use program track, yes. In this case, I'm doing a total setup, so I'm going to start with one. And so you can see the flashing light there in the background that's basically changing the status from the main line just to my program track. And so now I get this menu of main function off. The manufacturer for TCS is 153. Yes, that is correct. They're verifying that the decoder is model 91. Yes. And then activate short address or set up address. Well, I want to activate, but I want to set up an address. I don't want to use the short address. The short address is going to be the default of just three. Activate this address. Uh, no. And my long address that I want to have is 0649. Enter. Activate this address. Yes. And I'm not going to do any other functioning and stuff like this, so I'm going to just hit no. Motor controls, not at this point. Mapping, nope. And so essentially, I'm done. And so I can now hit to restore. And it's taken it as locomotive 649. And so now let's restore back to mainline power and see how it does. So headlights always a good thing. So we turn on the power. But you already see how it's kind of fluttering, kicking out and that. This is where having that power down or that cape and tape on those pickups really help. If you don't do that, it's gonna continue just to run kind of in that choppy out situation of cutting out. And that's not gonna be fun for any modelers in that. So we're gonna take it back to the workbench. So seeing that the locomotive was programmed and that it ran, but it didn't run so well, I'm pretty happy with that I can continue to move forward and say the decoder is in great shape. I just need to do some of that fine tuning with some cape and tape, making sure those electrical pickups are done. Now, when I have bench work of chassis in this sitting here, I always like to go through two. And once one has been programmed, put in its address. So this one is zero, six, four, nine. And this one's pretty easy to identify, but I always put that it is an E8A, and then I put an F on the front. So that way, if I'm ever fine tuning or changing this locomotive around, I can already say, okay, here's what the address is. Here's what kind of locomotive it is, if I absolutely have no idea. And then on this one, it's pretty obvious to know which side is the front. However, you'd be surprised when you get into like train masters or when you get into um, Jeeps and that. Sometimes it's a little more difficult to know which way is front. So if you already put that F there, it kind of helps with that. I also do the same on the other side of the locomotive, putting that address on, designating, you know, what type of locomotive it is. In this case, it's an E8A and then also putting that F on there. And so that's just something I've always been doing um, ever since I started um, putting decoders in locomotives. All right, I've already went ahead and pre-cut some uh, cape and tape into strips that I'm gonna slide underneath the headlight in hopes to kind of hold down some of the uh, pickups of this locomotive so that we don't see the cutting out that we did after I programmed it. So I usually put one right there, and then just kind of pinch the tape down. And then right at the ends are where the uh, electrical pickup is coming up from the truck, and those are probably the ones that are most important. Um, you don't want to push them down too hard where it's going to um, not allow the movement of the truck, but you do want to push them down 
maybe a little more tension on the sides so that as that pickup comes up from the bottom, that that brass plate that's run across the top is going to meet it. It's not going to float up. Instead, it's going to be held pretty, pretty much at the same uh, level point. Now, the back part of the locomotive, I mentioned earlier that I have a back headlight. I don't need that part. I usually do not cut that off until the very end. And part of that reason is if this decoder was defective and I went ahead and already cut that headlight off, it might seem kind of suspicious to say, oh, I'm sending this back and oh yeah, I cut the headlight off. But now that I feel like the headlight and the decoder is all in good shape, I could start taking that off at any time. So I'm gonna still leave it there temporarily, but very soon I will be trimming that off. So I'm going to do the same with the back of the locomotive as I did the front. I'm sliding that piece of cape and tape underneath the headlight, laying it across the brass plates there, and then just kind of adhering that tape down. And then I'll do the same for the very end. Underneath the headlight. And then right across the top, whoops, I kind of pulled on the tape a little too hard. I'll give that another try. And then just kind of push that down. So now we'll take it back to the track and uh, we'll see if it runs a little bit better without kind of that hesitation or that cutting out. All right, the cape and tape is on. And so now we're going to see if the engine runs a little bit better without that hesitation or the cutting out. So, lights on. And so far this is looking pretty good. And I still need to cut off the headlight for the back since it's an A unit and doesn't have headlight in the back. Or at least it's going to have a non-functioning one. So that little extra of putting the cape and tape across those brass pickups just really help with the conductivity of power to the locomotive. Uh, makes it run a lot smoother, not the cutting out. Um, and so I think for operations, for myself and for crew members, um, it's a whole lot easier to run a train that runs smoothly and reliable than one that kind of does the herky-jerky cutting out during an operating session. So I think we're ready to take this back to the workbench. All right, seeing that the locomotive ran very well uh, without the cutting out i'm going to cut off the rear headlight that i will not need it's always a good idea or at least for myself um, i save these because the headlight is still great um, nothing wrong with it, it just isn't needed for this model and uh, is a great spare for when I have another locomotive or if this locomotive sometime down the road the uh, LED headlight no longer works um, I can easily use the same um, leads in that and solder on and I've got myself a headlight so hang on to those things if you uh, think about it so I can uh, take the locomotive now and kind of start putting it back together All right, for the uh, sister locomotive that I was kind of using as just my example, um, pretty easy to put that one back together, just put it on the shell, it's good to go. This one, obviously, since it has the modifications of the fuel tank, I did put a little piece of double stick tape in there. And so I'm gonna start with putting the fuel tank in first and kind of pressing down. And I'm gonna put the shell on. However, there's a few things that still are not complete for the shell. Um, a couple detail parts that still have purposely been left off. 
Um, I did not put the rear view mirrors yet. Um, I'm going to wait until it's been painted. And then obviously the airline um, train line hose at the front of the pilot is not on. And then on the back, I have um, basically on each side for the MU um, cables and hoses and that. And that'll come on um, after the locomotive has been painted. So even though I'm going to put the shell on and maybe just do a test run, there's still a lot of detail parts that are missing. I also have the twin seal beam headlights in the upper and lower that will go in place. And then obviously the window glazing throughout the whole locomotive. And a lot of those detail parts aren't going to go on until obviously it's been painted, which that'll be in the next series. And then the other item will be putting in the couplers. And so I'm going to go ahead and just continue with the Cato coupler right now that's on there. But on the front pilot, I'm going to um, use the uh, Microtrains um, 1015s um, from the, for the front um, coupler pocket when we get to that point. So in this case, having the fuel tank on, um, having the piping run up the side, I'm just going to simply try to, whoops, one thing I'm thinking of just before I put the shell on, I always like to take that headlight in the front and just ever so slightly just kind of push it down, downward a little bit, give it a little bend. Otherwise it tends to ride up on the shell or the nose of the shell. So just don't need to be very hard, just, just taking your finger and just kind of pushing that downward a little bit. Um, that way it's not quite straight out there, it angles down a little bit. And so then just taking the shell, put it in place, and voila, we've got it ready. Let's give it a try on the layout. Okay, and at this point I'd say it's safe to say that other than missing the window glazing, and a few other detail parts and couplers, it definitely runs. Well, I hope you enjoyed part four of my decoder installation. I hope you will come back next month where I'm hoping that I get to the point where I prime this and get it into some paint and hopefully even into the decal stage. So hopefully you'll join us for part five in May. Take care, everybody, and stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.